All right, good afternoon. And today is? Thank you for paying attention, Olga. Thank you. You're a good student. All right, today is indeed International Women's Day, and the theme this year is The Time Is Now, Rural and Urban Activists Transforming Women's Lives, and celebrates the women's rights activists fighting sexual harassment, violence, and discrimination against women. In his message for the day, the Secretary General said the United Nations stands with women around the world as they fight to overcome the injustices they face. Let me be clear, this is not a favor to women, the Secretary General said. Gender equality is a human rights issue, but it is also in all our interests, men and boys, women and girls, gender inequality and discrimination against women harms us all. The Secretary General also spoke uh, this morning at a special event in the General Assembly Hall to mark the day organized by UN Women, and he emphasized that gender inequality, discrimination, and violence against women harm us all. Until power is fairly shared, the world will remain out of balance. And turning to Syria, today the United Nations and our partners were not able to return to Duma in East Ghouta because of the movement of the convoy was not authorized due to security reasons. As you will recall, on Monday, the United Nations and its partners were forced to leave after nine hours in Douma due to hours of ongoing shelling in East Ghouta and Damascus, so that 10 of our trucks were fully unloaded while four were partially unloaded. As a result, half of the food for 27,500 people was not delivered. The United Nations continues to receive reports of escalating fighting in East Ghouta and shelling on Damascus, endangering civilians and preventing humanitarian assistance from reaching hundreds of thousands of people in need, including thousands of vulnerable children. The complete assistance to reach a total of 70,000 people in Douma, including medical and health supplies, still needs to be delivered. The ongoing hostilities in East Ghouta have reportedly resulted in over 100 deaths in the past 48 hours alone. Since the 24th of February, when the Security Council adopted Resolution 2401, demanding a cessation of hostilities throughout Syria, hundreds of people have reportedly been killed, thousands injured due to fighting, due to air and ground strikes. The United Nations remains ready to deliver assistance to all people in need in Douma and other areas in East Ghouta and other hard-to-reached and besieged areas as soon as conditions allow. We continue to call on all parties to immediately allow safe and unimpeded access for further convoys to deliver critical supplies to hundreds of thousands of people in desperate needs of humanitarian assistance. And this morning in the Security Council, the Secretary General's Special Representative uh, for Afghanistan, Tamadichi Yamamoto, briefed members of the Security Council. He said that just one week ago, Afghanistan had successfully hosted the second conference of the Kabul process for peace and security, where all participants endorsed a call for direct talks between the government and the Taliban without preconditions. He said the government has laid out a series of concrete proposals for opening talks and is now up to the Taliban to come forward and start the direct talks to put an end to the suffering of the Afghan people. Mr. Yamamoto also expressed his concern about the deepening divisions of Afghan society and stressed the need for national unity provides the only basis for implementation of effective reform in the country. He added that the upcoming elections provide a further opportunity to ensure that unity and stability prevail and that all groups are represented. Mr. Yamamoto said the United Nations is working with the Independent Election Commission to ensure women's participation in all stages of the elections as candidates, campaigners, and voters, and is also working to ensure that election process can overcome prevailing skepticism. Mr. Yamamoto is expected to speak to you at the stakeout following the conclusion of today's meetings. And turning to Yemen, our humanitarian colleagues report that fierce clashes continue this week's in Sada governorate in northern Yemen. Airstrikes and clashes have also intensified in neighboring Al Jawaf governorate. In Sada, humanitarian partners are distributing emergency food assistance to 103,000 families across the governorate. Partners are also rehabilitating a water network and installing solar panels to power water pumps in Sada City for 10,000 people and rehabilitating water projects in Haidan for 6,000 people. Yesterday in the Council, Leila Zarugi, uh, the Special Representative 
of the Secretary General in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, briefed the Council for, uh, for the first time in her role as the Special Representative. She highlighted the progress made in preparation for the presidential and legislative elections in the country, paying homage to the determination of the Congolese people to participate in the political process. She stressed that a failure to generate confidence in the full and faithful implementation of the December 31st agreement will only serve to heighten political tensions and fuel the risks of inciting violence for political ends. During the time of the high intentions, the UN mission remains steadfast in its commitment to support the Congolese authorities to protect those most, most vulnerable and most affected by acts of violence, she said. And the Under Secretary General for Counterterrorism, Vladimir Voronkov, and Michelle Konik, Kon excuse me, Konix, uh, the Assistant Secretary General and the Executive Director of the Counterterrorism Committee uh, Executive Directorate, have just concluded two-day visit to Iraq with the support of the UN mission there. This was the first joint visit to the, uh, of the two UN offices since the creation of the UN Office on Counterterrorism 2017. Uh, the joint declaration congratulated the Prime Minister of Iraq on the military victories against Daesh and commended the Iraqi government for its continued long-term resolve in the fight against terrorism. They underscored the importance of a comprehensive efforts in accordance with the UN Global Counterterrorism Counter -terrorism Strategy and relevant Security Council resolutions. Uh, tomorrow, my guest will be Pramila Patton, the Special Representative of the Secretary General for Sexual Violence and Conflict. She will brief you on her recent trip to Iraq and uh, the Republic of Sudan. And we will uh, end the briefing here and open up to questions from you. Mr. Avni. Um, yes, it came up uh, in the visit downstairs of Netanyahu in the, in the exhibit, uh, the question of, of the UN disclaimer that says this is not mm -hmm. um, the views of the UN. What is the policy? And uh, that is in f that is in fact the policy. The policy is for uh, exhibits that are sponsored by member states in the not public area uh, of the uh, of the UN. That there is a disclaimer that says the content of the exhibit is the responsibility of the member state in question and not that of the United Nations. Uh, we put up that disclaimer for, uh, as I said, for exhibits sponsored by member states. All exhibits yeah. sponsored by All member states? All exhibits sponsored by member states, sir. Because I've seen exhibits that don't have that disclaimer. I, I can tell you, there, I mean, I, there was one in, uh, recently, I think the Indonesian, uh, if I'm not mistaken, and the, the disclaimer was there. Uh, I have seen that disclaimer, so. Uh, but it, uh, the larger question is, if uh, it's, you need to put a disclaimer on it, why allow it in the halls of the UN? The UN is uh, a place where many, uh, is a mem is, this building is the home of uh, member states. Uh, not all those member states have the same views on, on every issue. Um, it is, we are providing uh, the space for them uh, to have an exhibit. It is uh, the exhibit whether, for any mission, it doesn't mean that the Secretary General agrees or doesn't agree, it just means that it, the permanent mission in question is responsible for the exhibit. And if anybody has any questions as to the content, uh, it is up to the permanent mission to answer those questions. So is it only in situations where there's questions as for the content, or are there no. some s situations that are so self-evident that uh, don't need that disclaimer? I've rarely seen anything in the United Nations that is self-evident. Um, so the, the short answer is the disclaimer is there for exhibits that are sponsored by member states. Mr. Lee. Sure. I, I actually, I had asked you about that Indonesian one, uh -huh. and I just, I guess to be clear, to, to understand it more fully, when it was later taken down, the, 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 the advertisements or promotions for automatic weapons, tanks, and rocket launchers, it was said from, from this podium that the, the, they'd gone beyond what had been agreed to. So exactly. even though it had the disclaimer, the UN had had some negotiation as to what could be shown and what couldn't. Did that take place in this case? And I have yes, a, there's consultation for all, these, for all the exhibits. So, had, so on this one, this was agreed to? It's... There is consultations on the exhibits. The consultations do not imply that the content of any exhibit reflect the views 
of the Secretariat. And, and the, the, the question I wanted to ask is, you were the, I saw you were down there, so you can, Indeed and I mean I this with all due respect. Obviously, uh, Officer Sullivan, Matthew Sullivan, maybe he was to put in a hard spot, brought up to the microphone, but it, it seemed to me that he was saying that, that uh, each year at the GA he greets Prime Minister Netanyahu and reviews his speech, and then he said, you're a great orator, and then he said, he seemed to say that the, the cartoon of the bomb and the fuse was a particularly good speech. And I'm just wondering, everyone is definitely entitled to their views, but I know that many UN staff feel constrained from, from praising one way or another a, a speech viewed as controversial. And I wanted to I know, think it, I, what are the rules? I think Inspector Sullivan was, uh, was thrown into a limelight that he did not seek. Uh, the Prime Minister seemed to have, uh, to have called for him, uh, and the, the inspectors been here, has had a very long and extremely distinguished career here, is known, uh, he has known heads of states and heads of governments for a long time, including uh, the current Prime Minister of Israel, who, as you know, also served as permanent representative here a few years ago. Right, but I would say one, because you are saying he didn't seek it out, but I was, I was down there as well, and again, I mean this with all due respect, I saw him taking selfies with, with, with Benjamin Netanyahu before he was brought to the microphone. Well, so I think at both, like, at, both, at both cases, uh, the Prime Minister came, uh, called out uh, Inspector Sullivan and went to find him. Inspector Sullivan was there to do his work, to secure the area, to supervise security. He at no point sought out uh, to have but his photo this, taken. This, this detail that after each speech, I mean, because I, I, I know, for example, there was a, Ralph was a security guard, he was, but I've never heard him say one way or another if he liked a particular leader or liked a particular speech. I'm just wondering for the, for the benefit of going forward, because I've known people to be disciplined for it. I'm not, I'm asking you, what is the I, rule? I think, I, I've, I feel I've answered your question. Ms. Kent. Thank you, Steph. I know uh, that the UN is aware of the case of uh, Kavu Sayed Imami, the Iranian Canadian who died in Evan Prison last month under sus suspicious circumstances. Yesterday, his widow and two sons were boarding a flight uh, for Canada. They were dual nationals. Uh, the sons were allowed on, but the wife, the widow, was uh, barred from getting onto the flight, uh, the flight and, according to the Sons, has had her Iranian passport confiscated. And I'm wondering if the UN is aware of this, is in touch with Iranian authorities, what you know about the circumstances surrounding this, and if you have any more information surrounding the circumstances of uh, his death. And si ça serait possible, si on pourrait avoir la réponse en français aussi, ça serait génial. Let's go in English first. Uh, yes, we've seen the reports. Uh, we're, we're concerned uh, by the reports that the Iranian authorities have prevented the onward travel of Miriam Bombeini, uh, the wife of Kevu Sayed uh, Imami, uh, the Iranian Amer uh, Canadian uh, sociologist and university professor, as you know, died uh, in custody recently. Uh, as far as we understand it, his family was informed of his death on February 9th and was reportedly subject to pressure to proceed with his burial without seeking an independent confirmation of the cause of death. Um, and also at the time, I would refer you that the High Commissioner for Human Rights also expressed its concern at these events, uh, as well as the expressed concern at the arrest of other environmentalists. Um, nous avons effectivement vu les, les informations concernant euh, la, les, on, va, on va essayer de faire ça en français. Hein. On, nous avons effectivement vu euh, des informations qui nous concernent énormément euh, concernant euh, l'empêchement de voyager jusqu'au Canada de Madame Mariam Mombeni, la, la veuve de Dr Kavou Sayed euh, Emani. Nous savons que sa famille a été informée en, le 9 février et apparemment était le sujet de différentes pressions euh, pour enterrer euh, Dr. Emami euh, avant qu'il puisse y avoir une enquête indépendante sur les causes exactes de son décès. Yes, sir. Um, President Maduro of Venezuela yesterday was urging the Secretary General to appoint uh, as quick as possible a, a mission to observe the, the upcoming elections. One, can he do that? And two, does he have any response to, to that? Uh, the Secretary General cannot uh, dispatch uh, UN staff to observe elections without a specific mandate from the General Assembly or the Security Council. And a follow-up. Um, does uh, Has the Secretary General forwarded this um, 
request from Venezuela either to the Security Council or the General Assembly? I think the, the member states, as far as I understand, are, are, as I understand, are aware of, of the request, but there needs to, for any obs uh, observation mission, there needs to be a, um, a legislative mandate from either the Security Council or the General Assembly. Just one more, yeah, if I ahead. may. He, uh, President Maduro also said that uh, the uh, Secretary General was being lobbied by the U.S. Uh, not to dispatch this mission. Uh, do you have any comment on well, that? Well, I'm not aware of any specific lobbying by the U.S., but again, uh, or any other member state, but it's not the Secretary General's position, so any lobbying should be done to those who have the authority uh, to dispatch that. Monsieur? Oh, sorry, I'll come back to you. I, Thank I you. Apologize. Regarding Yemen, do you have any updates on the contacts by Mr. Griffiths with the with the uh, uh, with the parties or his whereabouts? Uh, Mr. Griffiths, I expect him to be here. I think early next week uh, to meet with the Secretary General, but no uh, no other political updates to share. Yeah, uh, are Stefan, do you have any uh, news about the developments in Afrin area, especially in uh, Jinder's area, a town which has been taken over by the Turkish forces today? No, I unfortunately do not uh, do not have any um, information. We are obviously uh, continue to be concerned about what we is most likely uh, a challenging humanitarian situation for the civilians that are well, there. When you talk about challenging, can you describe how challenging it is? Because well, I think what, any, what any, any civilians that live in an area where fighting is, is ongoing can uh, be described mini at minimum as challenging. For example, 48 hours, the water supply was bombarded for, uh, by airstrikes directly in, in that area. And people are, are looking the, the, for the, water everywhere. Okay, the question, sir. Yeah, well, this, did you get... A I, I don't have any specific information on that, but if those okay. reports were true, I think that, would, on, answer, on, that would answer the question. On Gotha, today, 30 families attempted to flee the conflict there. And then they came under shelling while, when they arrived at the cross point at the crossings uh, near Wafidin. Uh, do you have anything about that? Look, what, what is clear is that the security situation today in Ghouta did not allow us to send humanitarian aid in to see for ourselves uh, the situation on the ground. Uh, this is yet another reminder for the need for 2401 to be fully implemented, for the guns to fall silent so people can leave if they need to leave, the wounded and the sick need to be evacuated, and as importantly, uh, get humanitarian aid into the area. Yesterday, uh, we tried, uh, two days ago, we tried to deliver food aid for over 27,000 people. We, were, we had to cut the mission short. Today, we wanted to go back in there, and we were not able to due to the ongoing fighting. The fighting needs to stop. Unless it stops, we are, we are put in an extremely difficult situation, us and our partners, to try to get humanitarian aid in. Do you have any information that the rebels or the, the armed groups are preventing civilians from fleeing the area? I don't have any first-hand information. What I do know is that the civilian population uh, in East Ghouta continues to suffer under the sounds of, uh, under the uh, con constant uh, air and ground attacks. How, how did I'll, you have, I'll, sorry, I'll, sorry I, have, I have a follow-up on that. How do you have information that Afrin where uh, people are prevented from fleeing the area. When you don't have first-hand uh, observers. We, we, uh, we have, in, we go with the information that we have. Olga. <clears throat> Sorry to stop here. Uh, thanks, Steph. Um, question also about uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu's speech mm -hmm. downstairs. He has just assured um, journalists that Israel did not uh, walk away from the peaceful negotiations, but Palestine did. Just want to ask, what's the what's SG's view on the situation, and what uh, does UN see unwillingness of one of the parties of the Middle East conflicts what, what, to? What, what the Secretary General's view is is that uh, he's extremely concerned at the lack of progress in. Uh, a positive development in the peace process, the lack of direct talks uh, between the parties, uh, the creation of facts on the ground, uh, the ongoing violence uh, that we have seen. Uh, I, I think the, the reports, uh, the periodic reports shared by Mr. Mladenov uh, paint a fairly bleak picture. Um, and his Secretary General's view has not changed since the last briefing on the Security Council. Carla. 
and then Thank you. Uh, there are multiple reports that the U.S. administration has a complete vacuum of skilled negotiators dealing with the DPRK. Uh, as you know, Joseph Yun just resigned, and uh, uh, Victor Cha, was, his appointment was rescinded. The one person who does have the skill and is ready, willing, and able, and put it in writing, as you know, is Jimmy Carter. And when will he be considered uh, to conduct negotiations with North Korea, now that there is such promising development? But I think that's a question for the United States government. The Secretary General has, uh, I think, said that he would do whatever he can to help facilitate the process and offers his good offices, and that's his position. Yes, sir. Thank you. Regarding the assessment visit of UN and partners to Iran in Northeast Nigeria, what is the update? And how soon do we intend to see the aid workers return to Iran? Uh, I think the aid workers will return as soon as we feel the situation is safe. I will try to get you an update on the, on the current uh, assessment process. Abdel Hamid. Thank you, Stefan. Omar Kiswani, his, uh, his name is Kiswani, K-I-S-W-A-N-I. He is the president of Palestinian Students' Union at Bir Zayt University. He was uh, snatched by Israeli, so dressed in civilian clothes, uh, dressed like Arabs, from Bir Zayt University, from the campus, inside the campus. Is, was this report, uh, uh, made, did it make any uh, Repels at the UN level. The Mr. I have not seen. I'm not aware of that. I'm not aware. I was personally not aware of the report. But I mean, I this is look. something I, really major I, I, development. I'm not in debating the, that fact. I'm just saying I was not aware of the report. So I will see what we can find out. Okay, Mr. Avni. Uh, just sorry. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, one more follow up on the exhibit thing. <laughs> I'm sorry. You say you have consultations uh, with anyone who wants to put up a, a, it's a, an exhibit like that. So the question, two questions: A, what is the uh, the purpose of those uh, consultations? Are you trying to approve, disapprove, and B, have you ever has the UN ever? Uh, uh, banned any exhibit because the, it was too controversial. I'm not aware of any outright uh, ban. I think it's the consultations are there to come to uh, to an agreement that the exhibit and its content, while remaining the sole responsibility of the member state, uh, fall within a pretty broad category of things that uh, are not or I don't know what word to use, uh, not too uh, offensive, uh, and are there um, to ensure to ensure the exhibit can go forward, again, under the, the full responsibility of, of the member state. The consultations is not a seal of approval or disapproval. Um, it's exactly that, a consultation. Mr. Lee. I have some other things, but I'm sorry. Now, the, I just want to, since we're on this, I just want to understand it better. The, you had said that the Indonesian sponsored exhibit that had the automatic weapons, tanks, and rocket yeah. launchers, you asked them to take it down. So right. is that, that's not a ban? It was, it would have well, been. Well, I mean, it was not what was agreed to in the, in the consultations. And I also saw in the, in the lobby here a, a Chagos Island exhibit which had black electrical tape put over particular words. Are you aware of that? Did I'm not that, aware. I'm happy okay. looking to him. I wanted to ask you about the DRC. Uh, uh, just this morning, Sigrid Kag said that she'll be traveling, I guess, with Mark Lokok at the same time to the Democratic Republic of the Congo. And I asked her about the case of Michael Sharp and Zeta Catalan. She said she'll be raising it. But I'm wondering, what's the UN's update? What's the, what steps are being taken to get to the bottom of the death of these UN sanctions? As you know, the, the UN has uh, sent experts uh, to help support the investigation uh, by the authorities of the Democratic Republic of the Congo, those those experts ha are uh, have gone there. They may they may still be there. They're going back and forth, but they're working with the with the authorities who have the responsibility uh, to find uh, those responsible for the death of our colleagues, um, and we will continue to follow up uh, with them in that regard. And I also wanted to ask you uh, yesterday, just one, if you have any comment, the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum stripped a human rights award from Aung San Suu Kyi based on her response or, mm -hmm. or lack of response mm -hmm. in the Rohingya. I wanted to know if you have any kind of 
I guess, comment on, on that, and also what the status of the envoy. Many member states now, whenever the issue comes up, are saying they urge Antonio Guterres to move forward. Consultations are being, are being had. Uh, and I have no particular comment on the decision, the, the, as we say, the uh, sovereign decision of the U.S. Holocaust Museum. Linda and then Melissa. Thank you, Steph. This is going back to the clashes in Eastern Ghouta. Mm -hmm. And it's a little similar to Nizar's question. Basically, I'm trying to get a better sense of, of the fighting and the prevention of deliveries of aid there. And we know the UN calls for both sides to stop mm -hmm. fighting, et cetera. Mm -hmm. We kind of know about the government's role. But is there uh, any further information or a picture about the significance of the rebels' role in the fighting as well as uh, preventing the delivery of needs? Look, the, you know, we, we don't run a forensic military operation on the ground. So our uh, experts on the ground, our security uh, advisors who, who work for, for the UN, help make the determination whether or not it's, it's safe. Um, the environment in which uh, we have to deliberate in Eastern Ghouta is extremely complex. Like, like you said, you have, you have the government, you have also other parties. You also have other groups that may be under some, uh, to put it mildly, loose, loose command and control. Uh, so the danger comes from many, many different places. Um, and it's, it's an assessment that we have to make every time. Sometimes we make the decision not to go. Sometimes the government tells us we can't go. Uh, the point is the guns need to fall silent, and then we can actually bring aid in. I mean, when they brought a convoy in two days ago, there was still fighting going on, but at a level which they felt uh, they could still and should still try uh, to drive those trucks in. After nine hours on the ground, it was felt it was too dangerous. They had to turn. They had to turn back. Not all the aid was delivered. Um, I have to let my colleagues on the ground make uh, make those calls without without second guessing them. In an extremely dangerous uh, place, um, but we're not giving up in trying to get into the areas that need it uh, most. But you know, we don't have tanks to to push our way way through. We're delivering there in white humanitarian trucks with UN emblems and Red Cross or Red Crescent emblems. Quick follow up. Yes, ma'am. In terms of numbers, mm -hmm. um, we know that hundreds of people have been killed. Mm -hmm. I was just wondering if those numbers um, are primarily or just civilians, or they include you know fighters, and is there a way to differentiate? Uh, I think sometimes it's difficult to differentiate. The numbers that we have really focus on civilians. Melissa. Hi. Uh, thanks, Steph. Sorry, I don't know if it was me and I didn't hear it. I saw. I heard you say that you were concerned about mm -hmm. uh, um, uh, Mrs. Mambani being barred from leaving Iran, but uh, uh, my question was, is the UN raising this with Iranian authorities? Are you in touch with Iranian authorities about why she was barred from leaving the country and why she apparently had her passport? I don't know if any contacts were had today, but I know uh, there have been contacts at various levels. Yes. Sir. I have a follow-up. Yeah. Um, the uh, UN panel has come out with uh, a, re a report talking about the uh, a pattern of arbitrarily detaining dual nationals in Iran. Some human rights groups have actually come out and said that it's tantamount to hostage taking. Um, and I'm wondering what the Secretary, Secretary General has to say about it. Uh, it's not for us to comment on, on the reports of the various uh, panels or, or commissions. I, I would refer you to the, the Secretary General's remarks at the Human Rights uh, Council and the importance he sees in, uh, in the application of universal human rights uh, everywhere to all, to all countries. Um, and also what we've said the, the importance of all countries to cooperate with various UN human rights mechanisms. These are. Uh, Stefan, uh, people fleeing Afrin, many of them were interviewed by Al Mahdin, and they did not mention at all that they have been banned. We are talking about thousands of people fleeing Afrin and genders and other areas. None of them spoke about being ba uh, prevented from leaving the towns and villages, as you earlier mentioned a few days ago, that you have first-hand information that people are prevented from leaving the town by armed groups. You, you have information. I have information. Uh, I, I don't know what to tell you. I'll, I'll stand by, I'll stand by what, what I said. Where did you get that information We from? got it through the sources that we trust. How, in, in the case of Ghouta, also we have crew members there all the time. And we filmed even 
some of the civilians who attempted to flee were shot at. And the soldiers had to rush Nizar, quickly I, I think you've and save two children from them. you've raised, this point, you've raised this point before, and I've, I've answered it. People should be able to, be, to, to leave freely. But they, they, the most important thing right now is for the guns to fall silent and for the Resolution 2401 to be fully well, implemented. You have, you have on I'm, the one hand... I, I, wait, wait, I, no, 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 I think, I think, no, no, I think we're... I, we, we can come back. Nizar, I, 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 I will come back to you. Abdel Hamid, I always come... I always treat you fairly. Thank you. I'm going back to this exhibit. Stefan, I know at least three cases. When the UN interfered to remove a poster or a picture, I can narrate them now because... I personally uh, know about them. Now, how could the UN allow an, an art exhibit or archaeological exhibit that contradicts UN resolutions? Flagrant case of violation of UN resolution. Isn't that distortion? I'm not going to get in. I'm not going to get in to the content of this exhibit, OK? This exhibit went through the proper channels. Every permanent mission, whether it's a permanent mission of Israel or another permanent mission, has a right to use these facilities according to the rules and regulations that are applied across the board. This was the case in this exhibit, so, and I will leave it at that. Thank so uh, are these, every uh, tableau was approved by the UN? Or? I'm saying there were consultations. The content of the exhibit is the responsibility of the permanent member state that sponsors the exhibit. Can I ask you a hypothetical question? Uh, you can ask me, but I won't answer if it. If North Korea would do an, an exhibit promoting nuclear weapons, would the UN allow that? I don't answer hypothetical. I have trouble enough answering questions that are based on facts. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Stefan, on March 28th, there is a preparatory conference uh, on the International Conference on Nuclear Disarmament. Mm -hmm. Do you know whether any of the permanent five uh, members will be attending that? And does the UN have any comment about the fact that all permanent five members on the Security Council are in violation of Article 6 of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty? Uh, I don't know about the conference uh, and their attendance. It sounds like you could have five phone calls to make, and you can check. Uh, on your second part, all I can say is that the Secretary General uh, has stood firmly for the need for global denuclearization. Mr. Lee. Sure. I wanted to uh, – it was pretty, pretty recently that the Secretary General sent his very, very warm regards to President Sisi of Egypt. And so in that, in that connection, I wanted to ask you the – Noted photographer Mahmoud Abu Zaid, also known as Shah Khan, has now been informed that he faces the death penalty. He's been in jail for four and a half years. It's kind of a cause celebre. And I wondered if the Secretary General, who has these warm feelings, is this something he might have a comment on, a photojournalist being uh, facing the death by hanging? I will check on that particular case. The, the Secretary General stands firmly against uh, the death penalty. Um, and as for uh, questions of the, the ongoing climate in Egypt, I think I answered that um, to Masoud two days ago, and my answer stands. And I wanted to, on, since it's <coughs> International uh, Women's Day, I've got to ask this one. In, in, in Cote d'Ivoire, it's reported that, that on at International Women's Day itself, um, the labor law is being updated to ban women from working in jobs, this is the quote, where the work exceeds the physical capacity of women or work that presents danger that is unlikely to under or is likely to undermine their, mora their morality, including working underground or in mines. So many people are seeing this as kind of inconsistent with the trends that the Secretary General and others have been speaking I, about. I, I, I don't do, have the do details of the particular law, but it is uh, clear uh, to us uh, that women uh, can and should be able to have uh, any employment uh, they so choose. And when he did Thank his you. Facebook Live thing yesterday, I yes, wanted to ask you this. He, did, he seemed to take a question, I guess, online about India, and he said he's very committed to you know, no double standards and in the workplace. And as you know, UN, UNFPA in India is citing immunity in a, in a, in a, in a now widely publicized case. I would, I would, uh, I would ask UNFPA. Mr. Varma, the floor so, is yours. Well, I, I thought you would come back to me. 